Some fights are special in just how bad they are. I don't think it's funny. funny. I shouldn't be laughing this much either. <laughs> Today, we're going to count down our picks of the top 10 worst fights from the last decade in boxing. No one person is as pissed as me! That means we're looking at fights between 2010 and 2019 that were either so bad that they were kind of good or they were just plain bad. You know it's a bad fight when the official highlights are only 50 seconds long. Statistically, Robert Easter Jr. and Rancis Bartholomew combined to land just 106 punches in 12 rounds of boxing, which was the second lowest of any 12-round fight over the course of the last decade. Mo, on principle alone, I've given Easter no rounds and Bartholomew no rounds. <laughs> I mean, this is a miserable fight to score. In this, this round, Bartholomew has thrown 13 punches so far. Is that good? No. It's not. <laughs> a minute late in the day. That was not a compliment. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the judges couldn't split Easter Jr. and Bartholomew, and the fight was scored a draw. And the title remains vacant. Are you at all surprised? It's a no, draw? not at all. I, I mean, it could have gone either way yeah, by it's one point. Justified. Exactly. Neither yeah. guy deserved to win. <laughs> In 2012, decorated former cricketer Freddie Flintoff tried his hand at boxing and made his professional debut against Richard Dawson, who had a 2-0 record. Although Flintoff's effort was sincere, the technique he displayed was like something you'd expect to see in a drunken bar fight, and the only meaningful punch that Dawson threw put Flintoff on the canvas. He's just slapping a little bit with that right hand, that's all. The jab's a good shot for him, the jab's working well. Pals are here. And his wife. Ringside as well. Oh, dear. With the right hand. Oh, he's on steady legs. And anxious looks from the family. Oh. He's looking straight back at the referee to come forward. He's got to, be, he's got to tie up Flintoff. So he's fans along the way. He's got a hand from Flintoff there. The guy out. Eight months of hard toil and graft of staying away from the pizza and the red wine. And from Flintoff. Good right hand there by Flintoff. He turned from the call. After four two-minute rounds, Flintoff won the fight by a decision. A few years later, Flintoff appeared alongside Anthony Joshua on the panel show A League of Their Own and got roasted for his performance. Just slapping a little bit with that right hand, that's all. The jab's a good shot. I mean, what do you think, Machine? I think it was, you're like terrible. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> I don't think it's funny. funny. I shouldn't be laughing this much either. To be honest. <laughs> yeah. 2014's fight between Danny Garcia and Rod Salka was criticized as being a mismatch by boxing fans and the media from the moment it was signed. Garcia was expected to defend his WBA and WBC junior welterweight titles against Salka, who was unranked by both organizations and ranked at number 71 in the light welterweight division by BoxRec. Teddy Atlas and Todd Grisham lambasted Garcia Salka during a broadcast of Friday Night Fights on ESPN. Who is he fighting? Uh, what's his name? Rob Salka, something like that. He's not exactly a household name, probably not even a household name in his own house. Rod Salka. Now, Teddy, there are criteria and qualifications you have to meet to fight in a title fight. One of them is that you have to be either a top 10 rated contender, a former champion, or a current champion, among other things. He doesn't meet any of those criteria. So how is he getting this fight? But I wanted to show, but you saw the graphic that he's not rated. He's not rated. I wanted to show you that 15 guys in each one of those organizations are rated. He's not one of them. He's not even close. What is the sense of having ratings when you don't live up to your own rules? He's not rated. Oh, they have some little bylaws, some you need a microscope to look at it. 
Because of all the criticism, the WBA and WBC both refused to sanction Garcia Salca as a title fight, and instead it was changed into a non-title 10-rounder contested at a 142-pound catchweight. Here in Brooklyn, we are set for the main event of the evening. It is scheduled for 10 rounds at a weight of 142 pounds, and yes, the top dog at 140 pounds, Danny Garcia, in a non-title affair against a mega underdog, Rod Salka. The fight went pretty much as the fans and the media expected it would. Salka showed a lot of heart, but was completely overmatched and went down twice before being brutally knocked out by a left hook from Garcia in the second round. In December, he appeared on Show Extreme and dropped the wall, and he just got rattled there by Danny Garcia, and down goes Rod Salka. And there's a lot of time left in this round. I see him loading up everything. And a knee is taken by Saka. Free Steve Wolves making a face like he wants to stop this. And he may be very close to doing so, but Saka showing his grip. And Hart gets rocked with that left hook. Saka down, and it's over. Statement made by Danny Garcia. To no surprise, as he was the prohibitive favorite. The first all-British world heavyweight title fight in 17 years spectacularly failed to live up to the pre-fight expectations. WBA champion David Hay and challenger Udley Harrison's unsavory trash talk in the build-up to their grudge match generated a lot of interest in Britain. Initially, Hay was the big favorite to retain his belt. But as the fight got closer, Harrison's ultra-confident persona convinced many boxing observers that he was capable of pulling off an upset victory. This fight is going to be that one-sided, as, no, one, as one-sided. It's not going to be one-sided. It. it is going to be one-sided. It's not going to be a one-sided fight. This is what people need to realize. Like. So you're, you're here to, um, you're, no, you're here to stop it. Stop right. it being I, one-sided. It's not going to be a mismatch. You know, people think you're going to walk through and annihilate me. It's going to be as one-sided as anybody's ever seen okay. in a boxing. I've told you before, you were going to be in the fight of your life. You'll be unconscious. Okay. You'll be okay. knocked out. Okay. You need to be stretching out of the ring. Trust okay. me. It's going to be the fight of his life. As one side as you've ever seen. Yeah. On the night of the fight, Harrison appeared to completely freeze while Hay was uncharacteristically cautious and the crowd booed loudly at the end of round one after neither fighter landed a single punch. No punches landed in this round so far. Harris is making sure of that, so. Not too much happened and the crowd are aware of that. For much of the second round, the action did not improve, causing the referee at one stage to step in and tell both men to start making a fight of it. Whatever method you have to use to do that. And I think the referee's going to have to call for a bit of action. He's done that. He has. Luis Pabon from Puerto Rico says, how about some action, guys? And he's well within his rights to do that. In the third round, Hay rocked Harrison with a right hand and then followed it up with a sustained attack that put Harrison on the canvas. To become a world champion, now the big right hand has hurt him. He was stuck by that, the gloves were dropped. Hay knows it. Looks for an uppercut. Hands into him here, he's getting to him here. Oh, big shots raining through. Harrison has to suck it up, he does suck it up. Ian, yeah, that was a tremendous punch. Full credit for taking that. He needs to grab hold. He needs to grab hold of David Hay. <laughs> Harrison did get up, but Hay quickly rushed in and rocked him once more, which prompted the referee to jump in and stop the fight. And he's going to finish it here. I think he does finish it. All over in round three. There's your answer. David Hay shows his class in a fight in which only Harrison barely threw a punch. Following the disappointing outcome of the fight, both men were investigated by the British Boxing Board of Control. Hay was investigated after he suggested in several post-fight interviews that he had bet on himself to win in the third round. I can punch and land punches whenever I choose to. That's why this fight went to the third round. I put a lot of money on the third round. A lot of my friends and family did, so I didn't want to let them down by doing them too early. I said everyone it would go in free. And that's uh, exactly what he did. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of people made a lot of money tonight, <laughs> including me. Hay later clarified his claims by saying that he told his friends and family to bet on him to win in the third round, and the Board of Control accepted his version of events. 
straight away after the match, why did you say that you had put, I'll, I'll just read it Done. to you, so, to, to just double check what you're saying. I put a lot of money on the third round. First person, you said it about you. Why would you say that if you didn't bet? When you, put, when, you, when, you, when you tell your family to put dough on something, it felt like it was my money. You know, because I, I, I said to people, I know people a lot, a lot of money on that. So it felt like it was my money. Obviously, I didn't physically go and do it myself. Statistics from the fight show that Harrison only landed a single punch. And due to his overall underwhelming performance, some of his one and a half million pound purse was withheld while an investigation was carried out. It was a dreadfully negative performance by Harrison, that. Yes, it was, but we've had so many of those, we couldn't expect them to be any different. We know he is ordered, Come on, Harrison. come on, Jim, not even when he's fighting for the world title, when he says it's his night of destiny. We, we, we accept that, do we? In, we have to accept it. After the investigation was concluded, the Board of Control granted Harrison his full purse. Lawrence O'Coley and Matty Askin's 12-round ordeal in 2018 had only one positive. The pair may have found a cure for insomnia. Then they swarm all over each other, these two. We painstakingly counted 202 clinches in total during the 12 rounds and worked out that over 24 minutes of the 36 minute fight was spent in a clinch. It was very poor. I mean, Lawrence is falling in. You know, he's not willing to let his hands go in the middle. And then uh, Matty Askin's doing exactly the same thing as well. Like, you know, they've got to let him fight on the inside, but neither guy are willing to fight on the inside. And it's frustrating to watch at the moment. We want to see some action. O'Coley was deducted points in the 5th, 8th and 11th round, but would still win the fight by a decision. And the new British champion. The bell's going to go any minute. And it will be down to the judges. And new cruiserweight champion, Lawrence. Oh, Malik Scott showed up with his running shoes on for his 2016 fight against Luis Ortiz. From the opening bell, Scott was in survival mode, and despite being warned by the referee to start fighting midway through the first round, Scott barely did. You know, he's, and here you see him sliding over, trying to make the ring smaller and smaller for Malik Scott. Round after round, Scott constantly moved around the ring while Ortiz pressed the action and tried to get Scott to engage. When Ortiz did manage to pin Scott in a corner or against the ropes and land some punches, Scott hit the canvas. Knows that he's had problems with big punches in his temple. The weak Scott go down there. It's like he's anticipating that he's supposed to fall down. Scott went down a total of seven times throughout the fight but only three were counted as knockdowns by the referee. But here's it, mate, uh, Luis Ortiz doing all the punching. There's, that there's a left hand, hand to the head, and finally, apparently, Lene is going to call this a knockdown. And Scott claiming a rabbit punch, maybe hoping to get a DQ or something. Out. You know, Doesn't look like he's in any hurry to get up. The guy's now the Lene punch. helps him up. Scott didn't appear to be hurt on any of the scored knockdowns. His landings on the canvas were more a way of escaping major damage. At this stage in Ortiz's career, do you want this or do you want nothing? This is better than nothing. And there down goes the lead Scott. That'll be the second knockdown. And again, Scott puts his glove behind his head as if to say, I was rabbit punched, but that didn't appear to be the case there. Five boring rounds, followed by the kind of knockout where maybe Malik Scott's complaining falsely about a rabbit punch. Just makes the whole night stink. Best thing about this fight so far, it's on at four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the more eyeballs watch something like this, the less inclined they are to watch more boxing. I just feel like in order to get this out of my head, I have to go home and watch, you know, like Holyfield Bowl one or something like that. I need to somehow counteract this experience. It is now. Oh, there it is. <laughs> So we finish all 12 rounds in Monaco, and then obviously frustrated Luis Ortiz appeared to win every round. After Ortiz won the fight by a landslide on points, Scott's lack of effort was illustrated in the punch statistics. Ortiz landed 146 out of 472 punches thrown, while Scott landed 45 out of 155 punches thrown. American lightweight Emmanuel Williams certainly made an impression on his professional boxing debut in 2018, but it was for all the wrong reasons. Fighting live on ESPN against fellow debutant John Rincon, 
Williams was alarmingly void of any boxing skill and looked like a parody of a boxer as he hopped around the ring. If he can knock the fluffy feathered John Rincon. Oh, please. Oh. oh. Williams with a shot on the right hand. He's got some happy feet. Oh, oh my goodness. You can tell that Williams don't have a lot of experience, or maybe none. <laughs> well, they, they, this is the pro debut for both fighters. The semifinalist Rincon was in the Texas State Golden Gloves last year. Where's Williams going? Rincon deserves a lot of credit for going to the body once he saw the extent of Williams' skill set, and the fight was over after just 84 seconds. This one is over. John Rincon takes it in the first round of his first professional fight. Jorge Kawagi is a Mexican businessman, politician, reality TV star, and a professional boxer. In 2015, Kawagi returned after 10 years away from boxing and put his dubious 11-0 record on the line against Ramon Alejandro Olivas. Kawagi was sporting what looked to be oversized chest, bicep, and shoulder implants. Please welcome Jorge Kawagi! The awkward first exchange in the fight generated laughter from the crowd before Kawagi put Olivas down with a left hook that didn't appear to have much power on it. Pero, he has not fought for 10 years. After Olivas beat the count, Kawagi drew more laughter from the crowd as he threw possibly the slowest punches ever seen in a professional boxing ring. Nacho Beristein said, Kawagi is a fraud. He's, he's a, he, he throws punches in slow motion. But he's a lawyer. He's a law graduate. Law graduate. With just under a minute gone in the fight, Olivas fell into the ropes, and Kawagi was awarded a TKO victory. Let's 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 uh, set the record straight. Now, this guy Kawagi has political ambitions. Oh, this fight, which is being beamed to Mexico, should probably probably help him a little in his political camp campaign if you don't know your boxing. In 2010, Australian boxing fans and Danny Green were furious when Green's opponent, Paul Briggs, went down after 29 seconds of the first round. He is going to come out head hunting. Replays of the fight ending moment showed that Green landed a glancing jab at best before Briggs went down. Did he hit him? I don't know. I don't even think he hit him. No, I don't think it even hit him. The crowd looking at the big screen here. I, I think it's come off his forehead, but. Fans booed Briggs out of the arena while Green exploded with anger during his post-fight interview. All right, just chill out. No one's as pissed off as me, believe me. No one person is as pissed as me. Just chill out and give me time to speak because there's not one person in this room that is more jacked than me. And I can't say sorry for that person. He ain't even a canine. He's not even a canine. And Paul Briggs ain't getting paid a cent. He dogged it. And that's criminal what he just did. And I don't blame each and every one of you guys in here for being filthy. So as a, as a smarter person, I'll raise above that canine's level and I will apologize to you for his behalf. 
Briggs was later fined $75,000 for failing to reveal that he had neurological problems prior to the fight and had his Western Australia boxing license revoked. The world cruiserweight title fight between Danny Green and Paul Briggs has been declared a sham contest. Briggs has been fined $75,000 after an inquiry found he failed to disclose his medical condition, which prevented him from defending himself properly. There was also a police investigation after $100,000 worth of bets were placed on the day of the fight for Green to not knock out Briggs in round one. The inquiry also found betting irregularities, which have been referred to the police for investigation. Danny Green has been cleared of any wrongdoing. But I feel that the investigative process has been extremely thorough, and based on the evidence, I think the appropriate sanctions have been applied. It is believed that Perth street gang, the Sword Boys, were behind the betting plunge, but nothing was ever proven. As you've just seen with Green and Briggs, going down when there is minimal contact to the head or body is bad enough. But what's worse? Well, before we show you, here are some dishonorable mentions. They just have not gelled or clicked at all. It has come to an end, mercifully, if you judge the fans' reaction here at the MGM Grand. In 2014, Curtis Tate suffered one of the softest knockouts in boxing history. Ten seconds into the first round, Tate went down like a sack of potatoes after being hit by a soft punch to the shoulder from Jalei Zhang. Knocked out in the finals by the Italian fighter. Look. Quite frankly, there's a lot of pressure for me on Z Lee. Even though he's not in there with much, he's taking a fight on Tate. Who's taking oh, a fight Are on. you kidding already? Down goes Tate, they've waved it off! Yeah, it's a joke. I mean, I was just about to say, I mean, he's taking a guy that's eight days, this is a joke. What happened? Eight days condition. As you saw earlier in this video, Teddy Atlas doesn't hold back when giving his opinion, and he hilariously proclaimed that Tate had a glass shoulder. Sometimes you see a fighter with a glass chin. This one has a glass glove. His left glove gets hit. Watch, the first one goes, now that's nothing. Then the other one hits the shoulder. I'm sorry. He's, Tate has a glass shoulder. Maybe we should have some, some I, surgeons I look at that, some doctors do some x-rays to see if they can get the glass out of that shoulder. Look, punch, clean punch on the shoulder. <laughs> and down goes Tate. I mean, it's a joke. I don't mean... Well, I do mean to make fun of it because I'm frustrated. And I'm frustrated for the fan base, I'm frustrated for us, I'm frustrated uh, for everybody involved in this sport. Thanks for watching. Do you agree with our top 10? What's the worst fight that you've ever seen? Let us know in the comments and maybe we'll be back with some more Worst Fights videos. All right, he corrals him around the neck and throws him through the ring. I mean, Big Ben didn't even get clocked. <laughs> Once again, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video. You want that or you want that? You want that or you want your motherfucking title? Hey, get your shit off her head now. Take it off. Now get mad. Look up. Look up. You want that or you want your belt?